Okay. So um, today's lecture, is, I think, is going to be fairly short because we've done quite a lot yesterday. What we're going to talk today is about the Milley model versus the Moore model. So um, what's the difference between them? If you remember, in the first few lectures, we said um, the next states um, are always dependent on the current state and the inputs, where the outputs are either um, are a function of the inputs and the current state, or they could be just a function of the current state. Now, in the sequence recognizer circuit that we build, we came up with um, this equation here for the output of the sequence recognizer. And as you can see with the green ones, the Z output is dependent on the input X, which will make it a Milli model, model machine. Now, in a Moore model, the output will only depend on the current state, which means it will always just be a function of whatever cues of the flip-flops, and it will not be dependent on whatever inputs there are. Now, what we'll see today is that you can actually convert between the medium, Mealy model and a Moore model, um, and I'll teach you how to do it. But before we do that, let me give you an example of, the, of, an, uh, of a Moore model machine. So um, take this circuit. It's a fairly simple one. We've got a one flip-flop, which means two states, either a zero or one. And now the input to this flip-flop, sort of the next state, is a function of both inputs x and y that we have here, and the current state, which is being fed back into the flip-flop. However, the output z is only a function of the output of the flip-flop. In this case, it's a fairly um, simple, simple function of it. It's just a q. But it could be um, some function that re, um, involves whatever um, outputs from the flip-flops. Okay. Now, in this example, we can build a um, state transition table. Now, if yesterday we only had one input, which means two input combinations, here we have two inputs, x and y, which now will give us four columns for possible next state for every um, input combination and there is. Now, also, something to notice, if yesterday we had few columns for the um, output depending on the input combinations, now we only have one column for the output because the output is now only a function of the current state. It will be the same output regardless of whatever inputs we get. Okay. Now, when we have this kind of a machine, how do we present that in a state diagram? Let's have a look. So this is the table that was just there. Now, what are the differences between what we've learned and this Moore model here? So for a starter, if you look at the possible states, you can see that I've put in the output of the circuit right into the state circle. Because every state is associated with some output, there's no point putting them at the transition, but rather inside the state. So this one will represent state zero slash output zero. This will be state one slash output one. Of course, if the outputs were, say, one and zero here, then this would be zero slash one. This will be one slash zero. But you can just read it off straight on the table. Now, because the outputs are associated with the states themselves, there's no point putting them at the transitions. Now, someone asked yesterday how many arrows are going um, out from each um, state, and I said as many inputs as there are, as many input combinations are. Now, in this case, I've actually abbreviated each um, arrow to include more than one input combination. So, note um, the notation that here I'm using comma rather than a slash. A slash will um, separate inputs and outputs, where a comma will just give me a list of um, inputs. What it really means, for example, if you look at this state here, it means when the input is either 0, 0, so x, y equals 0, 0, or 1, 1, this one here, then stay at the same state, which is what we can see here from state 0, either go to state 0 or state 0 on those two input combinations, where if you have the other um, two possible inputs, which is this arrow, 
then go to the other state. Now, of course, I could have just um, drawn four arrows coming out of um, each state, but you know, it just simpler to do it that way. Whatever way you want to do it, that's fine, as long as you cover all the possible input combinations there are. Okay. So, um, any questions so far about the Moore model? It's fairly simple. In fact, the Moore model is, is easier and simpler to analyze and, and work with than the Milling model. I mean, when you associate the output with a state, it, it makes a bit more sense when you um, look at it and you read it. And you'll see when you design your own machines, then you probably want to have a state associated with an output rather than the transitions themselves. Um, the downside, though, is that, as we'll see in a second, more machines tend to have more states than the equivalent milli machines, um, and so they're a bit larger to design. But you know, um, you can think of complex complexity in how simple it is to analyze versus the complexity of the circuit. Trade-off. Okay. Now, as I said, you can convert between more and milli machines, and let me show you both ways to go about doing it. Suppose we start with a Moore machine. So this is an example of uh, one of the states in a Moore machine. We have the state S slash the output Y for some um, state and some output. We have some states going into it on input, we'll call it X1, and another state going into it on input X2, two different states. Now we want to um, convert this particular structure into a milli um, structure, which means we're going to have a state with no output associated with it, and we want to associate the outputs with the transitions. Now, if you think about the problem, what it really means is that instead of outputting the output Y when we're in the state S, then anything that will go into S should output that particular output Y, which is what we can see here. And if you want to think of it in a nice, simple way, you can think about us pushing the output Y into all the incoming arrows, because that's what it really means, that we're outputting the same output to all whatever transitions that are going to go into this particular state. And this is how we're going to um, convert it, and I'll show you an example, a proper example in a second. Uh, but this is the process when we're working with state diagrams. So take your output and um, push it out to all the incoming arrows. Now remember the incoming arrows, not the outgoing arrows. Now if you work with a state table, then it's pretty much the same process, but what you have to do is realize that now every output S that is going to be in the next state will have the output, sorry, every state S that's going to be presented as a next state in a state table will have the output Y associated with it, so, um, put that output Y with that state S. Now, when you see it as an example, it actually makes a bit more sense. So, I'll take some random uh, more machine that I've got up there, and that's the corresponding state table. And I'll work both ways. Let me actually start from the state table, the one at the bottom. And I said, what we're going to do, we're going to push this output Z into each one of the um, states when it appears as a next state. So first of all, let's list our states. So we have A, B, C, D, and E. Now, in the original table, we can see that whenever we, we are in state A, the output will always be zero. So all the places that we have state A as a next state, which is here and here, the output with this one will be zero. So I put A, actually let me use the notation, hopefully my eraser will work, yep, I'll, I'll put a comma, so, um, now, this is a bit of a different notation than the milli machines tables I showed you before. The only difference, what I've done here, I put the next state and the output in the same column, and you can see from the caption that 
it's going to be um, separated by a comma. Rather than put another column or two columns for x0 and x1 for the output. It is actually easier to read it that way. You can see A will transit to A, output 0, rather than um, A will transit to A and then where's the output somewhere over there. Um, so again, feel free to use either one of the notations when you, use, when you write your own tables. Um, let's just complete the other ones similarly. We have state B that will go, um, that will always have output 0 as well. So whenever B appears, I'll associate it with output 0. Any other places? No. C will have output 1. So whenever C appears in the next state, I'll associate it with 1, which is, I think, only here. D and E are both associated with 0. And I'll just complete the table. So D will be associated with 0 and E will be associated with 0. So hopefully everyone can see this is a more machine because outputs associate with states. This is a milli machine because the outputs are associated with the transitions. You'll get, it's probably easy to see on this one, you'll get different outputs depending on whatever the input was. All right, is this clear enough? Now let's see what happens um, when we're working with logic, um, sorry, with state diagrams. So let me draw the original um, state diagrams there. So we've got our five states. Now when we convert from more to mili, the transitions are going to stay the same. Um, what do we have here? This will be zero. So you can start off with just drawing the same thing. Do I have everything covered? No. B goes to itself. One. C, D, E. Yep. Now, when, remember what I said, that whenever you have this situation that the output is associated with the state, we're going to push the output out towards the incoming arrows. So if you look at, say, state A, the incoming arrows are, there's an incoming arrow from itself, and there's an incoming arrow from state D. These are the two incoming arrows. And we're going to associate them with what used to be the output of A. So the output of A is 0. So I'll just add those zeros over there in the transition. Similarly, when I look at B, I look at the incoming arrows. So one from itself, one from A, and one from C. And I'll have to associate them all with the output of B, which is 0. So. Um, C had an output of 1, so whatever incoming arrows, which is just from E, associated with 1. And then D and E <coughs> will have outputs of 0, so I'm pushing those zeros out. Simple. This is how we do it, converting from more to milli. Okay, yeah? No. Um, this is related to what you asked yesterday about um, the timing of the, I think you asked about the timing of when the outputs, maybe. Someone asked about it. Um, what happens in a more machine, the output will only be updated as soon as the state get update, gets updated. But if you have a look at um, the equation for a milli machine where the output is also dependent on the input, then you can't guarantee that your input will only change at the clock edges. You can guarantee that the states will change at the clock edges because of the nature of the flip-flop, but the input, which comes exter externally from somewhere, might actually change before the clock edge or after, depending on how you look at it. And hence, your output will change in a bit of an asynchronous time. Now, 
it's not usually a problem. I mean, it, it's the kind of things you have to think about when you design the circuit. But if you put things in a way that you um, only sample the output at certain clock edges, then you know what you're actually expecting, what's going to be the output. Uh, but no, they're not exactly the same, but functionality-wise, they're the same. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. All right, so that was converting from more to milli. Converting to milli to more. Now, we have a bit of a different situation. We have some state S, which is not associated with an output. We have some transitions to it on some inputs x1 and x2. They're going to give us some outputs y1 and y2. Both of them will go into our state S. And this state S, looking at the bigger picture, might then transit into some state T on some other input x3 and some other output y3. Now this is all very formal. We'll have a look at an example. It makes a bit more sense. Now, think about the problem. If you have y1 and y2 being the same output, say if one, y1 and y2 are going to both be zero, that's not a problem because then all transitions that go into S are going to output a zero and hence we can associate S directly with zero. What happens when y1 is not the same as y2? If one of them is zero and one of them is one, then what does S output? Does it output a zero or does it output a one? In fact, what's going to happen, we're going to have to split S into two different states now. There are similar states, but one of them will output the zero, the other, the other one will output the one. But because S later transit to some state T, but we just split S, we've got to remember that both of these S's, which are almost the identical um, state, only with different outputs, will both need to transit into the same T again later. And the same story with um, T, now we're associating with the output Y3, which was this one right there. So when we do it with um, logic diagrams, sorry, state diagrams, I keep mixing them, uh, we just split the state into two. When we work with tables, we got to identify all these um, kind of places, then we have different outputs going into the same state and then split them in table form. Now let's see how that's being done. Again, I'll start with um, the table form first. So we have our um, states A, B, C, D with this um, state diagram there. And you want to see what happens. can hear you all the way down here. Okay. Now, we said we want to identify all these states that have different inputs coming into them. So, we look at all the places when we have those um, states as next states, and we'll see if there's one that have both um, output zero and output ones associated with it. Let's have a look at all the places where A appears as a next state. So, we have this one here and this one here. Both of them are associated with output zero. There's no transition to A that will give us an output of one. Hence, we're happy with the state as it is and we can associate it with zero already. Let's have a look at um, next state B. So we have B here, here, and here. Now in this case, we actually have those two um, giving us output zero, where this one will give us output one. So we actually need to create two different states, one associated with zero and one associated with one. So we're going to have B associated with zero and B associated with one. Now I don't actually want two states with the same name because this will be confusing, so I'll just give him a bit of a subscript, B zero and B one. So these are the actual state names. You can call it, I don't know, call one B and then one F if you want. Um, but this sort of makes sense. Moving on, let's have a look at states C as the next state. We can see those two. They're only associated with zero. 
So we'll have C zero and we have D only associated with zero as well. Now filling up those next states, we just have a look at um, where um, each one of them will transit to and we'll figure out which state um, from there it's going to be here. So A associated with zero is just simply A in this new one. So all A comma zeros will just be A. Now all the places that transit to B, then B comma zero will go to B zero and then B comma one will go to B one. So you've got B zero, B zero and B one. All the places with C because there's only um, one C associated with zero. I'll just write C. Um, now, one thing I forgot. Now we, we actually split B into two different states. But we said both of these states will transit into the same next state even though we split them because they're almost the same one. So in the new state here, both of these will go to the same um, next state which was the same as the original state B. So I'll just duplicate this one here. And now that I've done that, I can just finish it off by filling up this state D there. Okay, yep. From this one, okay. Do you understand how, why I split B into two states? Yep. Okay. So, you know why I have five states? <coughs> okay. So now, this table is going to be almost the same as that table over there, but now we're converting to a more machine, so each next state is going to be, um, so, well, each state is going to be associated with some output, right? So all I'm doing now is instead of saying from A, go to A and output zero, I'll just say from A, go to A, and A is already implied to output a zero. Now the only difference is with B because sometimes we go to B and output zero, sometimes we go to B and output one, hence we have two different states with output zero and one and then we'll go to them accordingly to whatever we want. If we want to output one when we go to state B, we'll go to this state here. If we want to output a zero, we'll go to this state here. Yeah? Now the state transitions, as long as um, there's only one um, association with a the state, then it's quite straightforward. A will stay with A, um, this will stay C, and so on. The only difference is when we um, split a state is that we have to make sure, if we look at the previous sample, both of those split states will then transit into the same next state on all input combinations, which is why both B0 and B1 will go to the same states which are given in this one here. Does that clarify things? Yeah? Cool? Okay, any other questions? Nah. Cool, let's just do it with the state diagram as well. So when you work with um, state diagrams, we have to identify, shh, question was over, now we can be quiet. We can look at the arrows and identify all the places that we have incoming um, different outputs and then split them. So if we look at state A, both of them have output zero, so we'll just keep A as A. Where we, we already know from before that B will be um, need to, to get splitted. So we can see output, um, this output is zero where we have another incoming arrow with output one. So we have to split it into two states. So I'll have my B zero and B one. By the way, the reason why I'm showing you both this one and this one is just two ways to work with it. You probably won't get both of them um, in a real situation. You only work either with a table or with a state diagram. That's why I want you to know how to do it in both, um, both methods. But um, at the end of the day, they're pretty much doing the same thing. 
Now we've got our C and D, which always have um, the same incoming uh, outputs. Now I have to associate these states with the corresponding outputs. So A will be zero, B zero. Now imagine that these slashes are actually inside the circles. I didn't think about it when I drew the circles. Um, so I just associate those states with the outputs. And now in my transitions, I don't actually have to write outputs anymore because the outputs are associated with the states. But I have to be very careful where those arrows are actually going to. So we said with state A, we don't actually have a problem because in zero, we know that it's going to go back to zero with output zero. That's fine. And on output one, it will go to B. But which B are we going to? Now we want to make sure we have a look at the arrow over there. And we know that the original one that goes from A to B outputs a zero. So we want to go to the B that outputs a zero, which is this one here. And that's going to be on input one. Now we have to take care of, say, B zero. So B zero was the original B. And we know that B on um, input zero will go to state C. So this will go to state C with output zero, but C is already associated with zero, so that's fine. And on one input, it will go back to B. But again, which B is it going to? So we're going to have a look at the output, which is this one here. The output is zero, so we want to go back to that B with output zero. So that's going to be on input one. Now let's have a look at the case where we're dealing with um, the state B1. Again, the state B1 originated from the original B. So we look again at the same state B. On output zero, it will go to C uh, without, sorry, on input zero, it will go to C on, with output zero. So this will go to C on input zero. And on input one, this case here, it will go to B with output zero. Now B without zero is not actually itself. It's this one up here. So that's the major difference when you split states. You've got to be really careful about what's going to be the next state of each one of those split states. So that's going to be on output one. In a sense, if you really think about it, those two um, states, B0 and B1, are actually identical in the, in the sense of next state. B0 goes to either C or to B0 on 0 and 1 respectively. And B1 will also go to C and B0 on 0 and 1 respectively. So if you sort of understand this part, no problems. Let's just finish it off. State C will go to state A with output 0 on 0 and will go to um, state D with output 0 on um, input 1. And D will go to C output 0 on 0, and it will go to B with output 1. B with output 1 is that bottom one there. So now D will go to this one and not to the top one. Did I forget anything? Do all states have two arrows coming out of them? Hope so. Yep. Okay. Uh, so this is how we convert from milli to more. As you can see, milli machine has usually more states because we have to split states. But the circuit wheel will probably be um, a bit smaller when you design it. This is all I really want to say um, in this lecture. I'm uh, pretty much finished. Are there any other questions? No. Okay, I'll see you in tutorials and next week. Now, imagine, let me just get my uh, whiteboard. Get this there.
Um, there you go. We worked um, on Tuesday when we developed a state machine. We came up with a pen and recognizer. And there's a really interesting um, so a question or a challenge, it's not quite a challenge, about pen and recognizers. If I ask you to implement a machine that will take some input x, and I tell you this input x is a serial input um, that can either be a 0 or a 1, and it's a random um, input. It, can, it randomly chooses between zeros and 1. And I told you to find the pattern 0, 1, 0. Can you see at the back? Would you know how to build the state machine for this? You will have one output that will flag high once we see the pattern. And let's say for um, the question's sake, you will, once it detects a pattern, you will leave it up um, forever. Would you know how to implement such a thing? Maybe. If I change the question and I said a machine, same thing, only instead of detecting 0, 1, 0, let's detect 0, 1, 1. Would you know how to implement this machine? Maybe. We will do something very similar to this in tutorials when we had to detect um, two different patterns um, at the same time. But in this case here, I want one machine that will detect this pattern, one machine that will detect this pattern, and it will um, output it once, once it's detected the pattern, or um, keep outputting a zeros when, it's not, when it has not yet. Now, here's a question. Assuming First of all, do you understand the question in mind? We have some input x, keeps throwing in random numbers or random bits. Once we get to either this pattern, then raise the one in this machine. Once we get to this pattern, raise the one in this machine. Now, if we ran this machine, and let's talk about the first one, a lot of times, say a million times, and we try to check how long does it take for this pattern to appear once we uh, reset the machine. So, you know, we come up with, we start up the machine, we might get a 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. And finally, here we detected um, a pattern there. So this took us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 incoming bits until we finally saw the pattern. And this is just an example. It could have, might have happened straight at the beginning. It could have been happened over there somewhere. Now we want to, um, assuming everything is fully random, to come up, what's the average number of um, incoming bits between startup and until we see this pattern here? Obviously you can't quite think about it off the top of your head because random numbers, it can be anything. Um, and in order to come up with an average, um, you either formulate it mathematically or you do what engineers do and you put it into a computer and simulate it. And then you derive the, for the formulation. Now if I ask you the same thing about this pattern here, the 0, 1, 1, again, on average, how many bits do we need from startup until we detect this uh, machine here, uh, this pattern here. So assuming we've done the experiment and we came up with some number average for this machine and we came up with an average for this machine here. Now this will be a number, this will be a number. Those numbers must have some relation between them. They all either be the same number or this average here will be larger than this average here, or this average will be larger than this one. Now, when you think about the problem, 
and I'll ask you to vote who thinks well I'll let you think about it for two seconds let's start off with who thinks the averages are going to be identical makes sense the others don't raise their hands because they know it's a trick question. <laughs> now let's make it interesting. How many people think this average here, so we'll get this one sooner than we'll get this one on average? There's about four that I can see. Raise your hand up high. I don't know, about eight of you. How many people think this one will actually show up sooner? Slightly more people. About 12 of you. Again, how many people think it would be the same? Most of you. All right. Well, most think it's the same. Um, so I went and I, you know, did what engineers do and I tried running it. So I wrote a little C program. Um, Now, just to um, run you through, on, let me get my keyboard. Come on, flip the screen. The screen is now upside down, by the way. Let me just fix this. There we go. By the way, um, just if you remember on Tuesday I told you I had a bit of a fight with my computer. The fight was about which screen is going to be rotated where. I could not get both of them that I can see my screen normally and this will show up normally. One of them was always rotated. The only time I actually managed to get them both to display correctly that I can see what's going on here and what's going on there, then when I had my pen, whenever I drag it to the right, the cursor would go to the left and vice versa. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it was very frustrating. I could not figure out, eventually I, um, I figured out what the right settings are. Anyway, let's go um, quickly through what this program does. Um, the way I actually model this program is I said I'll have, I'll remember the last three bits uh, that I have and they will be, I'll store in X, Y and Z. And every time I'm generating a new bit I will push um, everything, I'll update the X, Y, and Z to be a sliding window. And then I will check, in this case here, it's a 0, 1, 0 pattern. And I ran some number of iterations. In this case, it was 10,000 iterations. So this is this for loop there. Initially, for every iteration, I put X, Y, and Z into an invalid state. So um, I called invalid minus 1. So um, so it doesn't detect it as a pattern by accident. And then I um, started running um, for each, each one of those um, runs or each one of those games. I ran this while loop and I said, have we seen the pattern yet? If not, then progress your window. Z will be, um, rand will just generate a random number, very big number. But if I want it to be either 0 or 1, I'll take the remainder or modulo 2 of the number, which will guarantee it will either be a 0 or 1. And, you, and I assume it will be a random pattern. And then I said, um, print out, just so I can see the patterns that are coming in, um, print out to the screen what's going on. And J is my counter of how many uh, bits came in before I actually saw the pattern. Then this while loop will exit once I found the pattern zero one zero um, I will add remember J was the counter um, of how many bits of seen in the pattern I will add this to some um, um, accumulator that will later become the average um, 
I will say for each one of the pens, and I'll run this program in a second, you'll see what happens. How many you'll print out, how many um, bits came in until I actually saw my pattern. Then after you finish all the iterations, and this is just a parameter I can change, I chose 10,000. Then take the accumulator of total bits seen in the whole game, uh, divided by the number of iterations, and this will tell us how many, um, how many bits on average we've seen until we detected each pattern. So, any wild guess, by the way, for this one, how many, throw a number, how, ma how many, 300? On, 300 on average? So you need 300 bits coming in before you can see a pattern. 15? So we had 300. <laughs> We had 15. Other guesses? It might happen first go, right? We might throw a zero, one, zero. Then it's three. Five. Five. Other guesses? Nine, eight. Nine, eight. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's run this. We'll see what we get for this pattern here. Um, where did I put it? Test. Let's compile it. So it's running. Average 10. Uh, just to show you what, what's going on in this program, we've got um, so the patterns coming in. And then until we, you can see that each one of those patterns stops once it detects a 0, 1, 0. In the end, and this tells you the number in brackets, how many bits came in until we actually saw this pattern. And it calculated an average of 10, which was somewhere around here, not so much 300, <laughs> but so this one was 10. And this is when it starts getting interesting. Let's try the different patterns, so I will just change my program that you need to detect 0, 1, 1. And then we'll recompile and link it and run it. Before I do, well, if this was 10, the majority I assume would say 10 as well because we said they'll be the same. But by now, you're sure it's a trick question. Um, any other guesses? Is this going to be more or less? Less. Less. All right, so how much less? Two or three. Two or three? Oh, two or three less. <laughs> so eight, seven. Fifteen. Seventeen. Twelve. All right, so how many, so obviously there's one guy here that thinks that this will occur quicker. A lot of other people think it will occur, occur um, later. Let, let's ask the class. Who thinks this will be a smaller number? All right. Who thinks it will be a larger number? So it's about half and half. Um, I actually would like to explain. Why, did, why do you think it's smaller? But if you got first, you got zero and go one, but the third is zero. It's not matched, but the zero can be the beginning of. Of another one, yeah, yeah. So it's possible it'd be less, because the first one can't do that. Yeah, but then we have a match already, if that's the case, which means that yeah, this will be quicker. First one, if you got zero and one, and you got one, that one cannot be the beginning of the zero. So. OK. Um, from those who, so, so you said that if we have a zero and a one, and then we have a zero on this one, it can be the beginning of the next one, but if we have a one here, it cannot be the beginning of the next one. So this one will be smaller. Um, out of those people who claim it will be larger, can anyone actually explain why more?
Okay. Alright, let's let's see what happens. We have a winner. That that is the reason actually. Um, if you haven't heard what the reason was, if we have a case that for example, if it's just something random that we get, say a one, 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 zero, zero, one, none of these machines win. If we have a zero, one at the beginning, in this case here, if the next bit is a zero, then we're not winning yet, but it's the beginning of the next pattern already. The thing is with here, if we have a zero, one, and the next bit is a one, which means it's a known win, we're back to the beginning, we're looking for another zero. So this will actually take longer. Um, the this one here. That's it. Now you can go.